Great to be here. And uh, Jared's talk previously was a uh, perfect uh, lineup for, for what I've got next. You know, it's really about figuring out when you're in production or going into production, what do you need to keep track of? And when things may go wrong, they don't go wrong as often as they do in a non-serverless world, but when they do, where do you look to figure out what's going wrong and, and how do you solve those quickly? So that's what we're focused on, on solving. So I'm Adam Johnson, CEO and co-founder of IOPipe. And previously to IOPipe, I was uh, deploying and building private clouds and software-refined networking for large enterprises trapped in the data center. Um, my co-founder uh, was an early member of Docker, and uh, we both uh, got a taste of serverless and went all in and decided to start IOPipe last year. And uh, we started by building some tools around serverless because uh, we felt that there's uh, a lot missing there. It's very early days back last year. It's improving very quickly, especially thanks to uh, the serverless team. Uh, and we started talking to a bunch of users who are running production Lambda workloads, and we found that uh, the biggest complaint from most people was just lack of visibility and instrumentation. Um, so Jared briefly mentioned before that you know CloudWatch is okay, but you may need a little bit more. So that's what we're focused on building uh, at IOPipe. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the ops tips that we've come across in working with serverless ourselves as well as with our users. And this is really a, a bit of a brain dump. I have to apologize. My, uh, my colleague Mike was supposed to come and talk about uh, his experience uh, running our infrastructure, uh, but he's uh, probably on a kayak right now. He's uh, flooded, <laughs> flooded in right now. So I sat down this afternoon and uh, put together my thoughts on really what we've been seeing over the last uh, six to eight months uh, with our users and with ourselves. We run a, a good amount of infrastructure in Amazon, uh, and most of our infrastructure is serverless as well to handle the mass amount of events that we take in. Um, so these are the, the things that uh, I'm going to talk about, and I'll have a little bit of room for questions. So first of all, again, like it's been mentioned a few times already, but there isn't really no ops. Uh, <laughs> there's definitely ops in, in a serverless world. It is just changing a little bit. It's different. Dev and ops are emerging a little bit, and it's very easy to get started with serverless, but it can be complicated quickly as you grow. If you're running hundreds of functions um, and using lots of third-party services, um, and functions are talking to functions that are talking to functions uh, and using multiple versions and regions um, and projects across your organization. It can be very, very difficult um, to make sure everything is working properly. So it's very important to focus on monitoring and, and analytics uh, as you think about these things. Even if you're early stage, it's good to get these things under control early on. So it was mentioned earlier, but really monitor the basics, like errors, the duration of invocations, CPU memory utilization, the outliers, um, look at the throttling that's happening. And I'll talk about some of these in more detail later. Um, and then look at the performance within the functions um, from the code level. If your functions are larger functions, you know there's uh, a lot of different patterns out there that are still emerging. Uh, but a lot of people tend to have a lot of logic in one function. And if you do, you may need to keep track of the performance as it changes, as you make changes to that function over time to make sure that you're not in introducing more uh, latency over time. Or if you're reducing latency, you might want to know that as well. Uh, and then most importantly, I think, is calls to other services, like other, you know, this is very AWS specific, but this can apply to any of the clouds like Azure as well, uh, but any of their services as well as external services, right? If you're embracing serverless, which we encourage you to do, you should be using um, as many services as you can to solve those hard problems. But you need to monitor these things. You need to keep track of them. So for Lambda itself, uh, there are a few different options. There's CloudWatch, um, which is great because it works out of the box. Um, but it has some cons. It takes several minutes to see the data sometimes. It doesn't get you down into the per invocation data. It just gives you high level um, aggregate metrics. Um, it doesn't show you underneath Lambda to know what's really going on, which, which I'll talk about in a little bit, why you might want to see that. Um, custom metrics uh, has some limitations. There's some throttling, but you can talk to Amazon and get that increased. Um, and then it can be difficult to navigate. There's several complaints about it, but it's basic. It can, it can get the job done. 
uh, but there are other options as well. Um, we've seen people do um, build their own solutions in-house, um, like creating a code wrapper and sending data to Elasticsearch with Kibana or Prometheus. Um, that gives them a lot of you know, custom analytics and very flexible and powerful, but it's not serverless. You have to run your own servers. It becomes very difficult to analyze that data. Uh, it can be very expensive to run, again, because you're paying for servers and people to manage those servers. Uh, and it may not be trustworthy to run your own alerting uh, and monitoring. Uh, so it's, it's better to trust that to people who have focused on that problem. And I'm not going to be really pitchy here, but we're creating a, a monitoring solution for Lambda. Uh, and we're looking at every invocation, um, looking at the basic metrics that we think are important, as well as uh, doing error aggregations and detecting memory leaks and looking for cold starts uh, and correlating these things together. Um, and most importantly for us is being able to see that data as quickly as possible. So we try to show that to you in less than three seconds. So moving to more of the kind of operations tips. So it's important to understand that when you're running Lambda functions, they're running in containers, and those containers are being reused. So this is actually happening most of the time. So if you run a function, uh, and then you run it again in another few minutes, it's probably using the same container most of the time. Uh, we actually built a tool. I didn't put it in the slides, but I might modify the slides later, um, which is like a serverless shell, so like Lambda shell, we called it on GitHub. And you can basically run it like a SSH command, and you just run commands, and it's basically firing those Linux commands through a Lambda function, and 90% of the time it's in the same container, so you can actually just SS, you can just run Linux commands uh, just to kind of poke around in the containers. We use that to see what's going on inside of Lambda. Um, and we open source that just if you're curious. Um, it's kind of fun. Um, but basically, you can have issues like memory leaks. Uh, if you have memory leaks in your code, they can happen in, in Lambda. Um, those containers are being recycled every several hours. So if it's not a drastic memory leak, it may not be a problem for you. But if Amazon decides to change that duration of recycling your containers, you may run into issues. We've seen that happen before. It's very rare, uh, but it has happened before. Um, file descriptor leaks and service handles, like talking to databases, if you're not cleaning those up, you're leaking those in your container, and you can run into issues that are very hard to diagnose. Um, there's a temp directory that you can write to that's limited in size. So if you're writing to that, your other invocations are also writing to that, um, so you have to be aware of these things. And then cold starts are happening. So cold starts are happening when the container is being recycled, essentially, or when it's starting up fresh. Um, and we're doing analysis on this now, but we found that typically cold starts are happening after about five minutes of inactivity or around four, two to four hours, actually, no matter what uh, kind of activity. So if you have a function that's always running, it's going to be recycled, and you're going to have cold starts regardless. And to dig down on that a little bit, so we found that that duration is between, somewhere between two to four hours. Um, we haven't seen more than four hours, except for a couple occasions um, in the early days of Lambda. Um, and then also when invocations spike, you're spinning up, Amazon spinning up more containers, um, so you'll end up with cold starts when they're spinning up a new container. So what is the impact of a cold start? Um, you're going to have increased latency, this varies greatly depending on a number of things. Depends on the language that you're using, depends on the kind of dependencies that you're loading. If you're loading a bunch of external dependencies or if you're using Java, for example, with a large war file, it may take a long time uh, to instantiate that. So that could take, we've seen in the worst case, it takes like two, three minutes. Um, but for most cases out there, it's only going to take probably 100 to 300 milliseconds uh, but it really depends on, on what's in your function, essentially. Um, and we've been measuring over the last 24 hours. Um, we added cold start reporting in, into IOPipe, so we started tracking that. And across some of the users who are using that version of IOPipe, um, we've seen about 1 to 1.2% 1 of all invocations are a cold start uh, so far. Um, and we'll, you know, I'll be putting a blog post together as we get more data to see if, that's, if that stays the same. 
uh, or not. And anything you can do about cold starts, well, you can, some people pre-warm their functions so they have kind of a cron job or scheduled task uh, running to keep it running all the time. But again, it's still gonna do a cold start every two to four hours regardless. Um, and you can also avoid or reduce your dependencies, uh, especially external um, loaded dependencies will reduce the cold start time. And if you want to start optimizing the performance, um, if you do run into problems, so to find those problems, you can start looking at the duration of the metrics, look at the 95th and 99th percentiles to see you know, where the spikes are happening, um, dig deeper into that once you do. So in IOPipe, we show you the per invocation view, or if you're doing custom logs, you can, you can figure that out on your own. Uh, but you can look into the per invocation view, uh, find the slow invocations, dig into those, and look at the metrics per invocation and say, is this a cold start? Um, if it is, then you either can optimize that if that's an issue for you, or just ignore it because it's just going to be always there. Um, or is it a memory CPU issue? If so, you may want to check the, the tier that you're choosing. So in Lambda, there are 23 memory, tiers, memory CPU tiers to choose from. They're memory CPU bound. So if you need a lot of CPU, you have to get a lot of memory um, and vice versa. Um, so in CloudWatch, you would look for out of memory errors. Um, in IOPipe, we, we measure that and we report that. So you can, you can see a graph to see where you're uh, sitting if you're running out, if you're about to run out or if you're way over provision, for example. Um, and you may want to do some tests to see uh, what the effects are because choosing a higher tier, uh, since it gives you more CPU, uh, it may speed up your invocations resulting in lower costs. Um, but this is totally dependent on your functions. You need to run some tests to figure out what's, uh, what is the best memory CPU tier for you. Uh, most users end up just choosing 128 until they see an error message and then they bump it up. Um, but if you have time and you want to optimize, if you have a ton of invocations, it may be worth your, your time to run some tests and just see um, what a good fit is. And if you want to dig even deeper, um, let's say you found that a function is uh, suddenly slowed down or like in certain times of day it's very slow um, and you need to figure out what's going on and it's not a cold start, um, then you need to look in within the function to figure out what's happening. So what you can do is you can use custom metrics. So CloudWatch has custom metrics. Um, we also have custom metrics, or if you're running your own setup with like uh, Elasticsearch, you could shoot uh, custom met metrics to that. Uh, but basically you would wrap your uh, code blocks that are in question, uh, time those and report those, and then check that over time. Um, it's great if you can monitor that, especially to look for any changes over, over time, especially looking at any of the other services that you're calling to. So third-party services, almost impossible to monitor these, so you should monitor those from Lambda uh, because you can't 100% trust those, so it's better to have a second set of eyes kind of keeping an eye on that just so that if you do have issues, you know where to point the finger, um, whether it's that third party or whether it is your own code. Um, highly recommend doing that. And then, of course, setting alarms and, you know, for any of the critical calls, any of the critical third-party calls that may slow down your application significantly or happening very frequently, definitely set alarms and thresholds on those. Um, so some miscellaneous things to watch out for. Um, retries, um, you know, if you're running Lambda, uh, it does two retries. Uh, and then it will just stop. Uh, they, they last year released uh, dead letter queues, which allow you to uh, send a message to SQS or SNS after two retries, so you can then do something else. Um, so I recommend checking that out. Um, if you're using Lambda within VPC, um, ENIs can accumulate uh, if you don't have your IAM, IAM roles uh, set properly. So uh, make sure that your IAM is set so that you can delete ENIs or don't use Lambda with VPC, um, but some people do, so it's good to, good to check that out. Um, if you're using the temp directory, um, make sure to check the usage of that because there's only 512 megabytes, uh, and if you run out, you may spend days debugging this problem, run into a bunch of people who had that problem and was not obvious at all. 
Um, and then duplicate invocations, these are very rare, but they are a thing uh, So in, in Amazon. So Amazon guarantees that your invocation will run at least once. Um, and occasionally we've seen where they will spin up two concurrent invocations that have the same exact request ID, same time, in two different containers. So if your application is assuming that this is going to run once, don't assume that. And you need to add logic outside of that to make sure that that's not the case. Uh, there's not much you can do about that other than checking to make sure that that's not happening. Uh, but it does happen. And then throttles. So the default is 100 concurrent invocations. Uh, you can talk to Amazon and raise that if you want to. But uh, if you are just starting out with Lambda and you haven't done that and you expect a lot more than 100 concurrent, you should talk, to, uh, talk about raising that throttle up. And then definitely set um, alerts on, that, on those throttles in CloudWatch. Thank you, everyone.